So good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, I have the pleasure of introducing you all to Melanie Hoff, who is our visiting artist today. Um, Melanie is an artist and educator examining the role that technology plays in social organization and reinforcing hegemonic structures. They study how platforms and processes, including algorithms, surveillance, and social media, yield distinct modes of seeing, thinking, feeling, while also reinforcing existing systems of power. Melody has presented work and creative research in various places that you've been familiar with, um, including the New Museum, the Queen's Museum, Tate Exchange, and Pioneer Works. As an educator, Melanie currently teaches at NYU, uh, the Rhode Island School of Design, Rutgers University, and the School, of, School for Poetic Computation. They're also a founding member of the Cybernetics Library and Soft Surplus, which is a collaborative artist warehouse space in Brooklyn. And with that, I hand you the floor, Melanie. Okay, thank you for that um, lovely introduction and thank you for inviting me. So my name is Melanie and this is one of the ways that my government sees me and it's a way that my name as well as something that I like to introduce myself with is uh, operationalized. And these are every file on my computer, arranged in a list showing their full file path. As a person that spends a lot of time online on my computer, and as an artist that makes a lot of work with my computer, what better way to introduce myself than to lay it all bare and show you in the most literal way possible the contents of my dear friend, my computer, a place I work hard to find home in. I am an artist, educator, and researcher interested in large and small systems, information flows, and epistemic discrimination, or in other words, the question of who gets to be sources of knowledge. I'm interested in studying and sharing the tools of social organization for social liberation and pleasure. There are three ways of thinking that are central to my practice that you might notice pop up throughout my whole presentation. Um, and the idea of a default, cybernetics, and a practice of sensing, noticing, perceiving, and learning. So I'll unpack those first and then um, throughout this presentation we'll show many projects in many different mediums spanning um, a few years and yeah, so um, get ready for a lot of projects. <laughs> um, so a default. A default is defined as the thing that exists or happens if you do not change it intentionally by performing an action. So it's um, a prescribed set of options or arrangement of things. Central to my practice is upending defaults. A default is selected automatically unless an alternative is specified. So how can we imagine alternatives? The defaults I imagine, um, I examine and like to break down are the standards of computer interfaces and structures such as the browser, computer fo folder organization, conventions around sexual labor and reproduction, and conventions around education in and outside of institutional settings. Ultimately, I'm interested in understanding how we relate to and what we expect from each other in order to ask more from ourselves, our governing bodies, and each other collectively. I think a lot about what it means to have a governing perspective and comparing that with technology and computation and ask the ways that governing perspectives, structures of containment and uh, control can both harm and hold. So cybernetics, another uh, uh, theme in my practice, which I'll, I'll expand a lot more um, when I talk about the cybernetics library. But very briefly, at the, up at the top of this presentation, cybernetics is the study of how systems are shaped and how we are made of systems. So it's a very broad term and it's totally cool if you're like, wait, what does that mean? Um, 
we'll, we'll get into it and it can mean so many things. So don't get, um, don't get turned away by feeling like it's a technical term or something. Um, and this practice of sensing, perceiving, noticing, and learning. And this is, I feel, really well illustrated in a text conversation that I had just this morning after meeting with two, pro two students from this very program. And my friend texted me, you know, how is it going with the Parson students? And I said, I love art students. <laughs> and she was like, really? Why do you, why do you love art students? And this is an art student who asked me that she's like, uh, what do you, why do you love art students? And so I'm, I screenshotted this conversation that's related to what I feel about um, sensing, perceiving, noticing, and learning. So she said, why do you love art students? And I said, okay, not all art students, but sometimes art students are people who are processing and researching things on their own terms outside of industrialized enlightenment era modes of understanding and documenting the world. Where I think art school and then art students can fail each other and themselves is when they turn their work into discrete sellable objects, which is also something that my friend thinks a lot about. But that issue with art students and art schools I find easier to address than the than the more process based part of that comes from the Enlightenment era, because um, the discrete sellable objects is at the end of the life cycle of a project as opposed to inherently part of the originating idea um, and basis for a work. Art students are one of the few disciplines where one's embodied intimate experiences of the world is encouraged to be explored is encouraged as a lens to complicate and represent ideas. So that's why I love art students and thank you to the two wonderful students I spoke with today. The origin of all theory is direct experience. And so this is a very empowering idea connected to sensing, perceiving and learning that um, we are sensing and perceiving and learning all the time constantly. We don't need a school to do this. We can do it all on our own and when we go to school and we learn other people's theories often white people's theories those theories all originated from those people's direct experience which you have bound boundless um, amounts of and so i like this idea to remind everyone that theory is not outside of you it's within you and now moving to the sharing projects of my presentation, my projects often fall in three categories, um, artwork, collectives, and pedagogy. However, the, these are very porous um, categories and I um, offer them only as a helpful way to um, simplify my body of work, uh, but not because I think something that is pedagogy can't be an artwork, for example. Um, so artwork. So I'm going to start way back in 2004 when one of my early creative projects was um, being part of a um, Riot Girl crust punk band when I was 14 called the Pocliticals. And we were based in DC and um, we, uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that as like a back background of my youth. And that also at the same time, when I was in high school, I was super focused on photography and I thought I would be a photography um, photographer for sure. Uh, and I ended up majoring in photography in college, but I quickly switched to metalworking and sculpture where I really started to develop an ethos of using precise tools imprecisely. Um, so this is what I, uh, this is my thesis in college. It was called 15,000 volts. And so in thinking about using precise tools imprecisely or um, specifically using the tools of science for aesthetic um, effects, I created a series of work that was about running electricity through wood.
So through this process of wood burning that created fractal effects in the wood, I was exploiting scientific processes for their aesthetic effects. And what I do now is exploit technology for social effects because the social is political and the political is social technology. Okay, so moving to much more recent work. This is just from two or one and a half years ago, a project called Garlic Trust. The Garlic Trust was a collaboration with an early net artist, Shuli Chang and rhizome.org. And it was installed at the new museum. And Garlic Trust is an uh, installation of garlic that we've planted and harvested on a farm upstate and it's set in a in a year in the year 2030 where capitalism has crashed and the only currency is garlic and so on this garlic cart is a router that has a special uh, wi-fi network that it's um sharing and when you approach the cart you can then on your phone your phone join the wi-fi network garlic trust and begin to play this trading game. And so the screen on the cart is a ledger of the results, like the high scores of the um, trading game. So when you play the game, it looks like this. So it is the year 2030, capitalism has crashed and the only cur currency is garlic. And the, um, so the, when you join the, the game, you are paired with another person who is online at the same time as you. And then you're put into a series of choices in the game that, um, that ask you to trust and then reciprocate or cheat your partner. So the rules of the game are based on a behavioral economics game or a social tool, social technology for quantifying trust that economists developed um, and the way that the game works uh, that economists often use in social experiments in the field to try to quantify how much certain groups trust and cooperate with each other. Uh, the rules of the game are such that the best outcome for the collective is for everyone to trust everything and everyone to reciprocate everything. And that maximizes the total amount of um, points or money that can possibly be gained in the game. However, the most profitable outcome for the individual is for everyone else to trust and reciprocate, but you to, to not trust and to not reciprocate, or in other words, treat, cheat. And a really simple way to think about this is the idea of taxes that maybe a lot of us are familiar with. So, the best outcome for the state is for everyone to pay their full amount of taxes and then everyone receives the max amount of benefit of clean streets and good hospitals and Medicare and um, good schools. But the best outcome, the most profitable outcome for the individual in taxes is for everyone else to pay their full taxes. You don't and you still receive 99.999% of the max uh, benefit of clean streets and good schools. So this is the router um, in, on the back of the cart covered in garlic, which um, the people in the game, they, they play for garlic that they can then trade later. And these are pictures of us uh, farming and harvesting the garlic. And then after the exhibition was at the new museum for a few months, we had an event on the beach where um, people who had played the game in the installation and for one week prior to this performance event, uh, we had released the game publicly online. Um, you could then trade your points in for real garlic on the beach. And so then the, the project becomes this like full micro economy of garlic and um, people who at the beach who could uh, play the game, join the, the router, or they could just use the points that they had played in the new museum or online before this event. And then they uh, walk, a, walk away with um, real garlic corresponding to the points that they won in the game. And here they're like uh, 
because they're next to each other and they're seeing each other, a lot of these people, they were collaborating. And so they'd be like, I'll trust you if you promise to reciprocate. And that was really cool to see. If you notice the guy in the pink shorts, there he is walking away with his winnings. And so that was Garlic Trust. And now I'll share about Draw What You Think Alexa Looks Like. So Draw What You Think Alexa Looks Like is a zine, potentially a book project. Um, it's been installations and workshops. Uh, the essential idea is very simple. It is asking people, often children who are growing up with a smart home device, to draw what they think Alexa looks like. How would you describe Alexa's body? What does it mean to have a voice without a body? That's something that's very unnatural, not um, that doesn't occur in uh, normal life. When we hear voices on the radio, those voices do in fact have bodies attached to them. Uh, what does it mean for a major company to fabricate a personality? And how are children internalizing that personality and then imagining that person's body especially a children who is not a child who's not very used to having voices that don't have bodies so i collected uh drawings by uh, from children age ages 2 to 15 in response to the question draw what you think alexa or google home or siri looks like and um I collected it by asking my alumni networks from various institutions I was part of. And I also posted on Twitter and in Reddit on slash our smart home, uh, where I found a, a bunch of parents, it's mostly dads who would participate in the smart home subreddit who were who would like saw this and were like, oh yeah, this sounds like a fun activity to do with my child. So some of the kids who responded I knew and many, many I didn't. And so here are a few of their drawings. And this is Lena, who actually responded to my prompt twice, one year apart. So this is a Lena's response at age nine. And then again, Lena responded at age 10. And now this I found really fascinating to see, you know, what changed for Lena's development and their understanding of a feminized um, robot character in one year. And this is Caroline, age five. This is Google. Her husband is a nurse. He works nights in a hospital. She works from home. Her daughter is home with her while she works and is playing dress up. That is why she's wearing a tiara. Google has a computer and that's how she can find all the answers to the questions people ask her. I thought that was a smart um, response. Google has a computer, that's why they know the answers. And this is Zora. Thatcher. And my favorite, Una's drawing. Alexa and her poop. She mostly yells at Alexa for either not knowing things or when Alexa just randomly talks and no one summoned her. And this was uh, Una's mother adding that um, flavor text at the bottom. This project also comes in the form of workshops where I use it as an opportunity to talk about um, AI and uh, corporate personalities with children in person. This, uh, this was a, a workshop at Pioneer Works and an installation at Pioneer Works. Uh, and these drawings I also um, collected at the Tate in London, uh, where I had an installation there. And these are, this is a poster that I always put up during the workshop. So the workshop is not very didactic, um, but I have this subtle poster um, to ground some suggested questions for kids to ask Alexa. Okay, so Decodelia. Decodelia is a Chrome extension project um, that I made a little intro video to, so I'll let that speak for itself. And is the sound, the sound comes through when I play videos, yeah? That, yeah? Okay, cool.
I'm not hearing sound. Is that just me? No, we've lost sound somehow. Um, maybe I didn't. Uh, I, let me reshare the screen and then make sure I click the share my sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's possible that I actually don't even have another. That might be the last video, but the, the sound's not that important. Um, so no worries if you didn't have it. Um, okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then share again. Desktop 2, share computer sound, share, play. OK, so just to give you a sense of what that sound was. And the wood burning video earlier, that was just recordings of the the electricity running through the wood. So it was actually kind of sounded similar, like static, like electricity um, pushing through the wood. So that was what you missed earlier. Um, not super important. Uh, so Decodelia is a Chrome extension that um, is installed in the browser. And what it does is it basically turns your entire experience of the internet into this uh, look, this kind of red pattern. and to the naked eye, it's in, indecipherable as to what is actually what you know URL you're on or what kind of content you're looking at. But with um, simply putting on red tinted glasses, all of a sudden you the the your browser comes into sharp contrast and you can read what's on your screen. And this um, this works by very very basic HTML and CSS. Uh, to change colors and um, using basic color theory and a interference pattern that is the same kind of pattern that we find on the backs of bank envelopes so that um, people can shine a flashlight through and then read your bank statements. And so these very simple and straightforward um, tools allowed me to create this Chrome extension that speaks to how when we are in public on our computers, there is a lot of um, information that exists on it that someone can see unless you have some kind of uh, protection there. And um, it just speaks to how there's so much, we think so much about the privacy that leaks on leaks from our computers and our online browsing patterns that leaks behind our screens. And this one is trying to address uh, the front of our screens while also being a little humorous and thinking of use cases like uh, that are kind of funny, like maybe you're at a coffee shop and you want to um, internet search the cute person sitting next to you or something like that. This would be a perfectly good use case for that. Okay, another project, Partisan Thesaurus. Partisan Thesaurus is a website, and it is a pair of thesauruses. The blue thesaurus generates synonyms using a machine learning algorithm that was trained only on a corpus of liberal leaning texts. The red thesaurus generates synonyms using a machine learning algorithm, the same exact machine learning algorithm, but one, the one that was trained only on a corpus of conservative or right-leaning texts. Our accumulated lived experiences shape who we are and how we perceive the world. Partisan Thesaurus focuses specifically on political rhetoric and suggests how exposure to only one kind of perspective alters the associations we make with any given word. What really makes meaning from a word? It's dusty static entry in the dictionary or the associations we make with it in real time whenever we hear or use a word. So the um, machine learning algorithm is again the exact same for both sides of this thesaurus, but one was trained on conservative texts and one was trained on uh, left leaning texts. Bias is baked into the corpus's algorithms drawn to make decisions that deeply affect our lives. With this project, I wanted to use machine learning to study something machine learning is exceptionally good at, being biased. So often machine learning is used to, to, to attempt to try to remove bias or to remove the human element 
and it continuously fails. And so instead I use machine learning to explore what it's already been so good at being biased. And these are some examples, which you can also try out. Please, you're welcome to try out any words on partisansesaurus.com anytime. And so a little bit more about how the algorithm works and why I was talking about the associations we make with any given words. So the algorithm that I used is called word to vec And the way that it generates these uh, words that I am colloquially calling synonyms in this thesaurus project, it looks at the text that it was trained on and it says, okay, the word truth what words statistically are used interchangeably with the word truth in this text? What words often appear around the word truth? What words, um, so for example, if, if we said, so in word to vec if the text had a lot of sentences like um, blue cat and green cat and brown cat and speckled cat, then blue, green, and speckled would be kind of seen as synonyms for each other because they're used in the same way. They're always used before the word cat. So that's, that's a little bit about how it works. So truth is used in, this, in a very similar way as words such as evolution and evil in the corpus that I trained it on on the right. And on the left, truth is used in very similar interchangeable ways with the words like facts, reality, fact, word, answer. And directly on the Partisan Thesaurus website is a link to all of the texts that I trained it on. It is not an exhaustive list. It is actually a, a quite a small list of um, very sort of officially canonically recognized left or right leaning texts political transcripts, novels by Anne Rand on the right, novels by, um, or books by Noam Chomsky on the left. And I'm, so I wanna be very clear about exactly the text it was trained on because I'm not making a claim about every conservative person and every liberal person. It's specifically these texts that I'm training on. And um, my, the limits of my corpus fall short in many ways. So for example, when searching words like twerk, nothing comes up because I am mostly t training on political transcripts and um, published books, which unfortunately don't really talk about twerk. And so when you search it, nothing comes up. So quite imperfect. I'd love to train it on um, Twitter and um, blogs in the future. So moving to the uh, second of three categories that I am placing my work in for the purpose of this talk, um, collectives. So soft surplus. Soft surplus, which I am physically right now, is a collective third space, and a third space is a space that's neither work nor home. It's a third space based on the idea of learning together by making things near each other. It's a 4,000 square foot warehouse in East Williamsburg. It holds uh, 20 some artist studios and members. We have an exhibition space, a kitchen, and a fabrication shop. And my friends Austin Wade Smith and Dan Young, along with 20 plus rotating members um, throughout the last couple years started this space together. And so actually if you can look if you look at this picture and you see the yellow um, the two yellow straps at the top of the ceiling and hanging down um, it from those straps is a trapeze and that's where I am. So that right next to me is that trapeze right now. Our priority at Soft Surplus is to welcome people whose creative practice is integral to their life practice who want to create a curious, playful, flexible, and empathetic community together. 
This space is organized through collective decision-making processes as in, and is in a continuous state of being built and created together, both in the ways and patterns that we relate to each other socially and collectively, and in the physical space itself. We built the space in many ways ourselves. Um, we have different kinds of workshops and events here all the time, although less so in quarantine. We prioritize trustful and personal relationships with each other over professional and work relationships. And to that point, um, Soft Surplus is not a profit making entity. We basically share the cost of uh, our rent for the building and maintaining the space. Um, we just distribute it among us and then that's that's our entire business model. So this is um, a video of us putting in the mezzanine, which I'm uh, sitting underneath right now. We cook for each other in our weekly gardening meetings, which are what we call our decision making meetings. So when thinking about creating new um, communities and places to organize and uh, create that that means that we can create all kinds of new systems and not accept defaults of uh, what um, a meeting looks like and how it's organized. So we have uh, rituals around, I mean, rituals makes it sound too, a little bit too much like a cult, but it's, <laughs> it's more just like we're open to, you know, it's opt in, opt out. We cook for each other sometimes. Um, and the, our meetings are called gardening meetings because it's not like some members are gardeners and others aren't like some people make decisions and others don't it's more like when you're in the meeting you are a gardener like and um they, we also have systems in place for uh people to reach out to anyone who missed a meeting and uh, consolidate the main points and um, ask if there's anything to vote on and things like that we just put in windows in the space my Mm, the, this side of my face would be much darker if we hadn't just put in those windows. And the cybernetics library. So cybernetics library is a different collective that I also started. And cybernetics is the study of how systems are shaped and how we are made of systems. So cyber, the cybernetics library, one of our main things is extracting the essential idea around this idea of cybernetics and approaching it as a very broad framework for understanding relationships in the world, both technical and social and environmental. Uh, another way of defining cybernetics is a, a transdisciplinary approach for exploring regulatory systems their structures, constraints, and possibilities. And when I say a regulatory system, I mean a dynamic set of factors that are moving in loops together, which is like literally basically everything, like a classroom is a cybernetic system, a conversation is a cybernetic system, race and gender are cybernetic systems, um, every system of governance is a, it's actually hard to describe even what's not a cybernetic system. If there are elements that are changing and relating to each other, there is a way to bring cybernetics into the conversation. And a regulatory system is, um, it, it speaks to specifically thinking about mechanisms either put in place intentionally or unintentional, un unintentionally that change that dynamic system. So for example, when thinking about like a school, the cybernetic system of the process of going through school and having teachers and students and grades. And so there's, there's all, so many things going on. Students are attending school, teachers are teaching, grades are being submitted. Now, when um, governments want to regulate that cybernetic system, one of the regulatory mechanisms that they put in place is um, for example, asking their teachers to hit a certain grade level, otherwise that teacher won't get paid. <laughs> so that's, a, that's one example of a regulatory system that the government puts in place um, to dynamically change the cybernetic system of education. 
Uh, we are a physical library that house um, a thousand plus books in a lovely uh, cooperatively run and owned space called Prime Produce in Midtown Manhattan. And we collect, and I guess, yes, yeah, so this is the same, the most central point of beyond just talking about what cybernetics is and ex exploring what it could mean for a very wide range of things. Um, the other most central pillar of the cybernetics library is that we both collect materials on cybernetics and we express cybernetics in the ways that we collect materials and in the ways that we share that materials. So we think about um, the library itself as a kind of cybernetic system that we then put our own playful regulatory mechanisms in place and these the process of ex experiencing these regulatory interventions to the defaults of a library are where you where we hope that people can feel have an embodied sense of cybernetics in real time like oh this like the normal way i used a checkout system was interrupted in this like playful and poetic way So we, we also ran a conference and explored uh, the, the standards of a conference, speakers, workshops, installations, a library. We explored that also as a cybernetic system and had many interventions that I won't go into super detail. Um, but this is a kind of a map that we made when we were planning the conference of all of these different aspects of it and how they would relate to each other. and. Uh, there isn't hierarchy. Uh, I think oftentimes a very common mistake that conferences make is putting the hierarchy of speakers above that of audience participation or of, um, or of the conversations and relationships that can be formed between, between audience members or participants in the conference, between themselves, not just between them and the speakers. Um, and we, all, we had a lot of uh, art installations that dealt with, that took in different inputs and outputs of the conference, which I know it sounds so weird, but this is an example of one at the library when you scanned a book into the system, um, our, our library checkout system, uh, which we called the library simulation. Uh, one thing that happened, one of many things that happened was um, the text from the book that you were browsing and scanned into our system gets scraped for sentences that end in a question mark. And then those questions get projected on the wall and asked to the speakers. So this was a question that came from a book that someone in the audience had entered into our library checkout simulation and then was posed to a speaker after their talk. How do the differences in social structure of each discipline influence the way its members behave? And they, to their credit, they answered it very well. <laughs> uh, these are other examples of cybernetics library installations that we make that um, interrupt different standards and defaults in a few different ways. So this was a new kind of library checkout simulation that ultimately created a networked poem based on people's responses to books they were checking out. Uh, this was an installation that we um, put up at the Internet Archive. We've had um, installations inside of um, bubbles. We had a browsing library pop up at the MoMA PS1 art book fair. When thinking about new ways to be with computers, cybernetics provides a framework for modeling and reframing human machine relations within social, legal, and digital systems. This way of seeing can grow into a way forward towards equitable poetic computation. So pedagogy is the last section of this talk. And I teach, uh, right now I teach at NYU as well as um, recently at Rutgers and RISD. And one of my favorite places to teach is at the School for Poetic Computation, which I'm going to talk about um, 
in this section. Uh, but first, as a bridge between the collective section and the pedagogy section, uh, the cybernetics library recently developed a workshop as well. So pedagogy became a part of the cybernetics library as well. And this workshop was called cybernetic choreographies. And we ran this workshop at the Tate in London, as well as MoMA PS1. This workshop, cybernetic choreographies, uses the social context of a workshop in an arts institution as its raw material. It is an experiment in cultivating cybernetic choreographies right here with each other in the experience of the workshop. And so what I'm, what I'm saying here is that when you have, when you invite people to uh, an arts institution and you say this artist or this group of artists is going to give a workshop, already you are dealing with so many expectations and default understandings of how people are going to relate to each other and what they expect from each other just by saying that like not even saying anything that the workshop is about and so this this workshop cybernetic choreographies uses those default expectations and understandings of how we're going to relate to each other in an art arts institution in a workshop um, as its raw material and this is a little a bit more about what it's about. Humans are capable of an incredibly broad range of behavior at all times. Any one of us here could be moving, singing, shouting, crying, even hitting ourselves and each other at any time. We are capable of this. And that we so often act within such a narrow band of that wide range we all possess is as flabbergasting as it is exciting because it means it is possible to shift and widen that band collectively. Cybernetic Choreographies takes its participants through a series of exercises about tuning and looping into each other. We have, uh, we create small little rule sets that then when we all practice together, create these um, feedback loops that we can we can experience and embody in real time. Um, they are, have pointing and they we do exercises with with breathing and humming together, both uh, dissonant and um, uh, synchronous sounds. And um, where it's about social norms and the conventions these conventions and social norms that are formed over generations, reproduced by each other and reinforced by laws that touch everything. Our existences are built on these compounding societal foundations of social norms and refiguring them can feel uncomfortable and even violent sometimes inside of us. And this workshop is about expressing that it's okay to feel discomfort with exploring these um, expectations and social norms and then trying to change them. The behavioral loops and patterns that we play with in the workshop are not so controversial. They deal with um, exposing expectations around uh, eye contact, sounds to be made to be made in public, greetings um, like handshake or hug, uh, personal navigating personal space. So these workshops are not so controversial. They are basic foundational social norms of just being together in a space with other people. But this workshop points to an imagining of what we what this would be like if we instead played with the defaults of gender with a culture of heterosexuality as normal with a culture of dominant whiteness. These are not defaults given by nature. They are formed by people and power over time. This workshop is about agreeing what the social conventions we're practicing here together actually are. It is about noticing them in real time as they happen, as if to watch ourselves in a mirror. When we call patterns out and begin to alter them, there is a range of willingness to move towards acceptance and away from expectations both in ourselves and in others. It's about noticing, playing, sitting with discomfort, 
but the kind of discomfort that's like when you stretch your muscles, it's like stretching your personality, but it should be like stretching your muscles when you are bending and reaching to create growth, but before the point of breakage. There is a continuous feedback loop of how others' expectations of social conventions are imposed on us and how we impose them on others. We are complicit in our patterns. They grow in us. They are of us and we can refigure them. So the School for Poetic Computation, I'm now switching to other classes that I teach. And I teach four of them at the School for Poetic Computation that I'll go through um, a little bit quickly. So this is digital love languages, codes of affirmation. This is what I'm doing right now, this summer for 10 weeks. Uh, we are only in our second week. This class is an introductory coding class, but it's done a little bit differently. Uh, we learn web pro programming, Python, uh, navigating the command line. Um, but we think about how as our daily activities and closest relationships become increasingly bound up with corporate systems of surveillance and exploitation, we explore and cultivate code as a love language that can be gentle, healing, and intimate. In this class, we ask, how do we want to live in a post-COVID-19 world? And what role do we want technology to play? Digital Love Languages, Codes of Affirmation is a class about building poetic tools for online communion through a reintroduction of ourselves to our computers. This class is a call to action for expanding computation's capacity for fostering interdependence and feeling. We build small personal software for affirming each other across physical distance. Technology is unpacked as a social process, not only a logic or material. Regarding code as a craft and medium capable of expressing the full range of feeling and desire. And one of the things I like to think about and imagine when teaching and being part of this class, because in this class and all classes I am learning too, right alongside the students, I like to imagine what would the world look like if every piece of software we used was made by people who love us? And what if we could make software for people who we love? And how different the world would look? Not only would it be specific, could it be tailored to the particular ways and idiosyncrasies that I might want to express myself to those I love? It would also be it would also be gentle and it could be, um, it wouldn't necessarily have to be designed at scale. There's so many of these online platforms we're using, we're using them um, in a way, they were designed in a way that were meant to be um, most useful in their, in the company's idea of useful to the most amount of people. And that's, not inherent it doesn't have to be that way software is not a limited resource and anyone can make software for each other that helps us communicate so it doesn't have to just be this thing that large companies do companies that don't love us so this is just in the first week of digital love languages class i asked the students to um, share what are their digital love languages right now and they came up with such lovely things. Digital love languages doesn't necessarily involve coding in a traditional sense. It can be about um, sending songs to friends in genres that they love. It can be about um, calling people even when you're paranoid that they're mad at you. It can be about long form email writing, long form platonic, uh, platonic walks of, um, on the phone playing two-player browser games on the same keyboard, making playlists, sending recipes of Chinese food to friends in lieu of sharing meals, making faces at my friends, sending them as pictures. And the first homework assignment in digital love languages is to imagine because we're, you know, we're embarking on this 10 week online class and all of the classes are going online now. Um, 
it's a really good opportunity to imagine like what could education be and so the first assignment is to imagine um, a speculative liberatory learning environment and these are two responses so this person drew their idea of a speculative liberatory learning environment that I encouraged them not to worry if it um, followed the laws of physics or seemed implausible. I've been thinking about the virtual edges of Zoom, this, this platform we find ourselves connected, bordered by pixels and learning through one zero one one zero one zeros and electrical signals. How will we project and overlap from these rectangles as we learn and teach each other, creating dimensions that intermingle? What does this place look like in our liberatory learning environment? Maybe a place where knowing and unknowing are the warp and the weft, untethered by types of right and wrong. It is a place with space that expands and contracts as we need it. It is flexible. Mutual aid is woven into the foundation. A library for ideas and experiences can be soaked in through multiple or singular senses that can be stitched together and carried with you like a glove, but also unwound and rewoven into a community of threads or carried along by another. And this one, which I just want to highlight the quote of um, learning begins to feel like healing from some notes on a speculative liberatory learning environment. Okay, so another class that I teach is um, it's about files. So remember all the files I showed you that are every single file in my computer. And this presentation that I'm sharing with you right now, this too is a file. And this is its location. It's located in my home folder, uh, then in Dropbox and in presentations, and then in artist presentation. <laughs> yeah. This presentation is 1.22 gigabytes. Uh, so this connects to another class I teach called folder poetry. Folder poetry is a term that I developed to describe the common practice of computer folder organization. Oh, it's, it's a using the common practice of computer folder organization as a new kind of poetic form like the haiku or iambic pentameter. By naming and nesting folders and files, we can create unfolding narratives, rhythmic prose, and choose your own adventure poetry. Folder poetry is about making poetic um, folders and files, but it's also about how coding isn't just something that happens behind your screen in funny languages. Coding can be a holistic process about changing the way, and it can change everything that you do on your computer from the way that you name your files or organize your folders to completely change how you perform routine tasks on your computer, such as moving or um, deleting a file. Learning to code is very exciting to me. And it's not just about learning these languages in with a black background and usually green text or something when you think about a hacker. It can, it's about changing the relationship between yourself, your computer, and the things that you create together. So these are some folder poetry examples. And each of these lines of text is a nested folder inside of the one before it. So, so to read this poem, I would say, Sam's humble village, Sam internal, questions. What if I never go outside ferns.txt? And this is ferns.txt. And um, so in this poem came from a prompt of imagining a village and creating that in a folder structure. And this, um, this was a more open prompt. And this screenshot is of many different folder poems all displayed in their tree structure. So the top level is the, um, is the first folder and then it goes into it in the tree structure. And this, so this is a few different poems that I collaged together. And I'm gonna read the one that's in the top right, which I'll show you bigger here. It was written by Cy X. I was looking for time, only to find portals of love.txt, of trauma.txt. 
I was looking for time, future.txt, past.txt, present.txt. And then I'm going to open present.txt. Words are limiting. The present is more than the now. It is the then. It is the moment trap tapped into or tapped out of. And folder poems can come in many different forms. Some of them are written more like sentences, where some are more about the way that they, the patterns that they make when you view them in their tree structure. A folder poem can be experienced by reading it out loud like I just did, by screenshotting different parts of it, or more um, initially as the process of moving through each folder uh, from the terminal or command prompt of a computer, which is wh what we're learning in this class, but can also be moved through in Finder. So if you can imagine like clicking through and then seeing what's in there and then clicking in and seeing what's in there. So these are all ways to experience a folder poem. And I've made folder poem into zines and I've taught folder poetry in Detroit and in Japan. Through learning to code, we can transform our relationship to computation from something we buy to something we make. In classes that I teach, we transform computation into imagining places that we want to live, into imagining places that we want to learn, and to imagining places where we want to love. Our worlds are shaped through codes of many kinds, codes digital, social, legal, Many of these codes weren't created by people who look like us or who are our friends. If we make things for ourselves, our friends, and our communities, we can contribute to this transformation for others. And so if you've ever thought to yourself, I'm not a computer person, I'm never going to learn to code, consider that people with power, programmers, and uh, people in the tech world wanted you to think that about yourself. So the most um, exciting idea to me that I've that has come out of my uh, teaching to code uh, projects is uh, the idea of always already programming. My workshops assume no coding experience and simultaneously take the position that everyone who interacts with computers is in some way already a programmer. Now bear bear with me here. I'm saying that you who who may have never coded before is actually already a programmer. Technology is usually made available to us after many layers of abstraction have been imposed. In this process of abstraction, its inner workings are obscured and most people are excluded from understanding it. Everyone who interacts with computers has in important ways always already been programming them. Every time you make a folder or rename a file or check your email, these actions that you're taking through moving your mouse and clicking and typing, maybe clicking buttons, these translate into text-based commands or scripts that run behind the scenes, and eventually those scripts turn into binary. When you use a visual interface, when you're moving your mouse and clicking buttons, these text commands are being fired in the background and eventually to binary. And yet, why are the common conceptions of what a programmer is and what a user is so divorced from each other? Why are you considered a user because you click buttons that fire scripts and the person who wrote the script that is fired when the button is clicked called a programmer? I mean, that doesn't seem like a really significant difference to me. And yet, in our minds, programmer and user are these really different things. And once you learn to code, you realize that copying and pasting is the biggest part of programming. So you're not even writing your script that the button fires when a user clicks it. You're not even necessarily writing that by yourself. You're using prepackaged um, functions that come with programming languages. And so isn't that the same as a button, a prepackaged script? that automatically does something that someone before you wrote? My answer is yes. The distinction between programmer and user is reinforced and maintained by a tech industry that benefits from a population rendered computationally passive. 
And that's what I mean when we say, when I say, if you think of yourself as never a programmer, I'm never going to learn to code. And that maybe people wanted you to think that way. Maybe you were the society, our society was designed to produce people that think that way. If we adopt the role of less agency, then we make it harder for ourselves to come into more agency. So we, we unpacked the user and, and the programmer. So just to repeat myself, the user is someone who clicks buttons that fire scripts and the programmer is someone who put that button there and put the script that fires when that button is clicked. But they're, for example, using JavaScript, they're using pre-written packaged functions and variables in order to carry out the actions they want their code to do. In this way, the programmer is also the user or is just as much the user as you. Why is using pre-made scripts seen so differently than using buttons that fire pre-made scripts? So two more classes to talk about and then I'm ending. Um, so the cybernetics of sex, technology, feminisms, and the choreography of control. I've also taught a version of it called the cybernetics of racism and sexism with Hineta Bomani. And in this class, we ask what can cybernetics, the study of how we shape and are shaped by systems, teach us about the sexual and social reproduction of gender and sexism, and also racism in that previous class. How does sex become gender and what are the politics surrounding who gets reproduced? And I mean that literally, desire politics, like who exists in the world and how is desire, reproduction and prejudice a part of determining literally who gets to live and die. And I think about that um, more from the birth perspective. So I think about like who, who gets to be even put in a position to be born. We explore how social regulatory systems are encoded into technological platforms and disentangle how they produce social pressure and govern behavior through engaged activities, discussion, and project making. In this class, we don't shy away from difficult conversations and we work closely together to cultivate a space of openness and mutual support, which is really important when talking about very real, often painful things like sexism and racism and gender and um, who gets to be born. So lastly, I'd like to share Code Societies. Code Societies is my largest pedagogical project to date. It is a temporary school a collection of students and teachers, a learning society enmeshed in coded systems. It is a specific society made from all possible societies. It's a three week coding and critical theory intensive about how code and society form each other. And I'll go into a little bit more, but first I wanna talk more specifically about the School for Poetic Computation. So this, it's an artist run school where I teach a lot of my classes and um, it's neither vertical pedagogy, uh, top-down pedagogy, or completely flat horizontal pedagogy. But where is it? At Code Societies, where it is, is determined collectively by the participants that make it. It's very much about looking at the patterns and expectations that we bring to this learning environment and changing them ourselves, deciding as a group what we want it to be like. So for, ex for example, this most recent time I taught it uh, in January for three weeks, at the beginning, I asked the participants, do you want to be called students? Is that a, a title that you are actively moving into? Because we don't have to accept that as the default in a school. It doesn't have to be teacher and student. We can, we can call it, we can call everyone participants. We can call um, as stewards of this learning society. And um, they, they did elect to be students, but it felt really different for a school to have participants that have chosen that title instead of it being defaulted to them. And this is a map of the entire US educational system. The US educational system is social infrastructure and it's a technical mechanism. Where does SFPC Code Societies fit in here? 
I mean, it's way off the map. The government doesn't recognize an artist-run school as a learning institution. And that's the government's fault. But um, we, we also, maybe we don't want to be seen by the government. Maybe we don't want to be included in this structure because this structure is clearly, just by its design, you can see it's meant to funnel people through and filter people out. It's meant to control. So I don't need my artist-run school to be on this map. And, and so my school is unaccredited. Often the structures of American University, of, often the structures of the American University do not support the interpersonal capacity of connection. A map, this is a map of a governing perspective. And in my work, I think a lot about what it means to embody, recognize, build perception of a governing perspective, both from within that system and that perspective and without it. How can a governing approach harm and how can it hold? How can technology harm and how can technology hold? All of our identities matter in spaces of learning. The identities of you, the students, the identities of the admin, the identities of the teachers, we all come with different social histories and racial and gender backgrounds and these all matter in spaces of learning. I consider the School for Poetic Computation and Code Societies a dynamic possibility space to imagine and cultivate new learning environments with and for each other. Code societies, their technology and their infrastructure are as shaped by culture as much by our technical capabilities. We can have a voice in these systems if we choose to have one. We engage with code and the ways code acts on our bodies and networks equally as subject and medium. Code societies is about the many different kinds of codes, social, digital, legal, so social codes like social norms around handshakes and eye contact, social norms around uh, gender and race. It's about digital codes like algorithms that determine our news feeds and the algorithms that um, facilitate us texting our mothers that we love them. It's about legal codes, like the codes that decide who gets to live where, at what price, who goes to jail, and who gets to marry who. So it's about all the kinds of codes that form society, how they accumulate, braid together, reinforce, and are in conflict with each other. It's about forming for each other a new liberatory relationship with computation, and in so doing, seeing other systems of power that surround us, because code is a conduit for understanding the operationalization of so much. To have fluidity to intentionally move between codes of many kinds is a path towards living in the society you want to live in. And the ultimate comp of code societies is hidden in the verb of the name, a directive to code the societies that breathe with you, that open you up instead of close you down. I'm just give, I'll just let you read. This is a student um, who was talking about their experience at Code Society. It was very distinct from other computational environments. And at Code Societies, there was a way of refusing educational standards that expect us not to ask, not desire, to not honor the needs of our own minds and bodies, to not admit places of confusion or unknowing. And yeah, the, code's, the title of the workshop, Code is the Verb, to Code the Societies You Want to Be In. Now that's a very big ask. And this is the Code Societies group of winter 2020. And when I ask people to imagine the societies they want to live in, not only imagine them, but then to begin to code them. And when I ask people to uh, reframe their relationships to their computers and reframe their relationships to sy large systemic systems like um, racism and uh, decisions made by this by the governments. I'm asking really big questions and not because I know the answers. I don't. But what I do know is that asking hard questions is magic. To ask is to imply answers are possible. If we believe answers are possible, we're much more likely to find them to find the capacity within ourselves to propose new ways of being in relation with each other.
Thank you. That is the end of my talk.